Welcome to this lesson on functions of multiple variables. Uh, up until now, um, we've talked about functions as things that take inputs and give an output, uh, although for some time we've been a little bit more focused on functions that just take one input. That said, most functions in the world take way more than one input. The world is a complicated place, right? And so we need to have some uh, mathematical uh, methodology for dealing with things that depend on more than one thing. And so I just want to give you a few examples, a few classic examples of, of these kinds of multivariable situations. Um, one example that maybe some of you have seen is an ideal gas in chemistry. And one way of framing the ideal gas law is that if you know a gas's pressure, and you know how much of it you have, in other words, the number of molecules, and you know the temperature that it's stored at, then there's a function that can give you as an output the volume that that gas should take up. Another example is the ISLM model in macroeconomics, and this stands for um, investment, savings, liquidity preference, money supply. This is a macroeconomic model, and um, I think the picture I'm showing you here is probably not the way you know most economists would think about this, but one thing you can do with this simple model is say if you know government spending, and you know taxes, and you know the money supply, then there's some function that gives you as an output the gross domestic product of the country. Okay, so this is a multivariable function that in this very simple macroeconomic model depends on three things. Here's an example from pharmacokinetics, um, which has to do with tracking and studying how drugs are metabolized in the body. And you can imagine a function that takes two inputs. One input is what is the dosage of a drug that a patient has been given, and the other input is what is the amount of time that's passed since that dose was given, and the output of this function is what's the concentration of the blood in the drug, the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream at that point. So there are a number of ways to describe multivariable functions, right? A formula or an equation is, of course, one of them, um, but there's many others, right? You could have a table of data, and I'll show you an example of that. There's something that may be new to you called a contour diagram, um, and we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about those and a closely related idea of cross-sections. Okay, so we'll, we'll run through some examples of these. Here's representing a multivariable function as a table. I've chosen a simple function that has two inputs, so we can represent it as a very simple table on a piece of paper. Um, and the function is the National Weather Service heat index, right? So this is basically how hot it feels to you outside. And you know, of course, that um, how hot it feels to you depends on the temperature. And the hotter it is, the hotter it feels outside. But you also know that things might depend on humidity and that, you know, 80 degrees at 40% humidity feels a lot cooler than 80 degrees at 100% humidity. And in fact, for this function, the difference between those things is 7 degrees. It feels 7 degrees warmer to you um, at 100% humidity. Okay, so this is just um, you know, a quick way of representing a function as a table, independent variables along the top and the side, and value of the dependent variable in here inside the table. You can, of course, represent your function as an equation. We can go back to our example of the ideal gas, where we'll let P represent the gas's pressure, V the volume, N the amount of the gas, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is the temperature at which the gas um, is stored. And if you ever took chemistry, you heard the ideal gas law, which is PV equals nRT. Okay, and of course, one can rearrange that to solve for V, V equals R N T over P. So this is a function where you plug in the amount of gas, the temperature and pressure, and you get out the volume. And sometimes just to make it really explicit what we are thinking of as being the input variables, you might even write V with our input variables in parentheses right next to it. All right, and now something that might be new for you is a contour diagram. And the way to always think of a contour diagram is kind of like a topographic map. A topographic map tells you um, at a particular latitude and longitude, that is, at a particular um, location on the surface of the Earth, what's the altitude? In other words, how high are you? How far above sea level are you? And what you're supposed to do to make a contour diagram is you find all the points in the XY plane at a particular altitude that you pick, 
you connect all those points with a curve and you label it. And I just want to make this really explicit by walking through an example. So um, we've taken the function here, x cubed minus 3x plus y cubed minus 3y. And what you're seeing in this graph are the two independent variables, right, x and y. So I haven't yet shown you anything having to do with the actual value of the function f, showing you the two input variables, x and y. And suppose we want to know where the function equals 0. OK. Well, we can ask that question, where does the function equal 0? And one place that the function equals 0 is at the point 0, 0. You can see that just by plugging in here. That's pretty easy. OK, so I'm going to put a dot there. And here's another point where the function happens to equal 0. You know, you can find it using your calculator. Or really, the way you would do this is with a computer. And you'll learn how to do that in a different screencast. Um, here's another point where the function happens to be 0. Here's another point. This is the point 2 comma minus 2. Um, if you plug that into this expression, you'll see that the function's 0 there. You can go on plugging in points. Here's the point minus 2 comma 2 up here. Okay, And you can go on, use calculator, use a computer, find a whole bunch of points. You start to trace out something, and you connect them all with the curve. Okay, So that's this orange curve I've drawn in here. Consists of a line and this sort of ovular shape. And we've labeled it with 0, because it turns out that at anywhere on that orange curve, um, the value of the function is 0. Okay, And this is called a level curve of the function. Okay, This is the 0 level curve of this function. It's all the latitudes and longitudes at which the altitude is 0. right? And then you can go on, of course, and choose other values of the altitude. And if you pick some other values, like here we've picked um, uh, negative 1 and negative 3 and 0 and 1 and 3, um, and we're showing all of those contours, all of those level curves on the same plot, and this is called a contour diagram. Okay, And um, you know, if you think about this as topography, you start to notice certain features. Like here, you move from minus 3 to minus 1 to 0 to 1 to 3, so you've walked uphill. And actually, this kind of um, shape of these concentric rings um, it indicates a hill because the contour values go up as you move into it. Here there's something similar, but the contour values go down as you move into it. This is something that sort of looks like a valley. This is the basic idea of a contour diagram, and if you ever get lost in how to interpret a contour diagram, I really urge you to go back to thinking of it as latitude, longitude, and altitude, even though your particular function you might be studying might have inputs and output, inputs and an output that have have a different meaning. Okay, um, and so uh, let's talk about one other way to represent functions, and this is as a cross section. Uh, and the example I want to take here is something from economics called the Cobb-Douglas production function. It tells you as a function of capital and labor how much a particular firm produces, Q. Okay, so Q depends on K and L. Capital means like how many maybe materials, you know, how many uh, machines does your factory have to produce stuff. L is some measure of your labor force, how many employees do you hire, how long do you hire them for, and so forth. And Cobb-Douglas function has this form, which is very famous in economics. It's some constant times K to the alpha, L to the beta, where alpha and beta are also constants. So here, just to be concrete, I'm going to choose c equals 10 and alpha and beta equal 0 0.5. Um, and I showed you a contour diagram down here. And now we're going to talk about cross sections. And what a cross section is, is when we fix one of the variables um, at a particular value. So what I would like to do is just set l equal to 5. I'm going to insist that l is 5. And graphically, that means that we're thinking about sort of moving across this horizontal line in the LK plane, right? This is the value of L equals 5. And we can ask, as we walk across this line, um, how does the function change? Well, since L is fixed, the function only depends on K now. So we're going to make a plot of Q as a function of K with L fixed at 5. And we see a curve that looks like this. And that makes sense, because as we move along this curve, increasing k, we cross from low contours to higher valued contours. And we look at those contour points. OK, so this is called a cross section. We've fixed one of the independent variables at a particular value. Here it's l equals 5. And we've just made a regular graph of what remains. All right? Um, 
We can take another cross section. Here we could take L equals 45. And if we do that, we get this red graph here. And the only thing I want to point out about it is that it's different from the L equals 5 cross section. I also want to point out that because as we walk across, we cross the contour lines faster, or the, another way of saying that is the contour lines are more closely spaced, um, this graph goes up faster. So the closeness of the contour lines here versus the you know, width, the, the far apart width of the contour lines as we move across here is why this red graph goes up more steeply than this blue graph. Okay, so those are cross sections. These are sort of walking horizontally across the contour diagram, but of course we can walk vertically as well. So now we're gonna take a cross section where we fix K to be 10, and we're gonna increase L from bottom to top, and we get this blue curve over here, Q of 10 comma L. And then we can ask the same uh, thing, what does the cross section look like for K equals 40 um, as we walk up this red line here, and Q of 40 comma L, uh, looks like this red curve here, and you can again notice that the red curve goes up more steeply than the blue one, and that's because the contours are close together here, and they're further apart here. Um, I want to add a couple of things about contour diagrams. Sometimes it's confusing for students that um, there's a finite number of contours, and you might wonder, like, you know, what's going on in between these contours? And since there are no contours shown there, the answer is, well, we don't have enough information to know. We have to guess. But usually we guess that things continue the same pattern as they have um, in other places in that region, right? So we moved up from 200 to 250, here from 250 to 300. If I asked you what was the value of the function here where I drew a point, you might look at that and say, well, it's about halfway between the 250 contour and the 300 contour. So I might guess that the function value here is, you know, maybe approximately 275, right? And of course, the other thing is that there are an infinite number of contours. There's a 201 contour. We just haven't drawn it in. There's a 202 contour. There's a 207.69324 contour, right? The contours fill up the plane really densely, but if we drew them all in, it would be impossible for our brains to process all that information. So we pick sort of a finite set of contours and show them and those uh, give us the pattern of what's going on. And like I mentioned before, computers are really good at doing this for us. We've reached the end of this lesson. I want you to ask yourself if you can do the following things. Can you identify and explain what the independent and dependent variables are in multivariable functions? Can you interpret functions that are represented as tables of numbers and as equations? Can you interpret contour diagrams? Can you figure out what they mean? Can you figure out where they uh, are steep and where they're not steep and where there are hills and valleys? Um, and can you use them to make uh, function value estimates? And finally, can you interpret cross-section plots and connect them with contour diagrams? Okay, thanks for listening.